Ashley uh, Gashbar Begus, and he'll talk about LLMs as linguists. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, everyone, uh, for being here this Friday afternoon. So I want to talk today about the metalinguistic ability of LLMs. Um, and all the papers I'm going to talk about are uploaded here. So what we've learned, I think, so far is that LLMs can do language pretty well. Um, I think that's, that's now relatively accepted. Um, so you can ask it to write a poem and about a workshop on LLMs at UC Berkeley, and it does that. Uh, you can ask it to uh, try to understand this sentence, the mouse of the cat that the dog painted thoughts hang. Uh, who did what? <laughs> okay, uh, GPT has no problem with that. So uh, the cat paint, the dog painted the cat, the cat thought the mouse and the mouse sang. So this is center of bedding. So they can, they can understand this um, pretty well. Um, as cognitive models, uh, so as models of human language learning, I don't think those transformers are the best models. Uh, why no baby learns from text um, and piles of text? Or, and no, no babies learn from so much text as GPT-4 is trained on. Um, no baby learns without the production perception loop, right? The way we learn language is we speak and we listen. Um, so instead of uh, text, we use speech in the first five years, um, seven years, however many, when it depends on when you start reading. Um, and no baby learns without communicative intent. So in fact, when I try to do language modeling, uh, I, I, I prefer GANs. Now, this talk is not about GANs, because this is a transformer workshop. And I don't want to talk about GANs, because I'd be biased, because I prefer GANs for cognitive modeling. They learn more like humans uh, from continuous speech data. They get um, symbolic representations on the way uh, that resembles, that resembles how humans learn language. Uh, you can build models where they, you know, there's a perception production loop. The really interesting part about GAN is that they learn by imitation, imagination. Um, they have communicative intent and so on. So as a model of co cognitive uh, language development, I don't think LLMs are, are amazing. I mean, you can do stuff with them as well. Um, another advantage, by the way, of speech is speech is more interpretable in many ways than text. So you can do kind of this introspection interpretability that I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about later. Um, so so I, I'm not particularly fascinated by LLMs in terms of you know, being a realistic human-like model of, of language learning. I am fascinated by them um, in, in terms of they can tell us how, what is possible in uh, artificial neural com computation, right? So obviously language, um, they can do language pretty well. So it's language abilities can emerge in an artificial neural network that has no language like um, uh, neurons or whatever devices. So they're great for telling us what is possible in, in ANNs. Um, so if you think of um, what the next frontier is, now that the language is kind of, you know, we all agree that LLMs do language well, what's the next frontier? And at the next, you know, if you think of a child at five years old, they can speak pretty well. Their language is pretty good, but they won't be able to tell you what a noun is or what a verb is or what a voice is fricative is, what a glottal stop is, although they are using those. Um, so what, what we wanted to test is, can these large language models reason about language itself? And, and you know, this is kind of a testing metacognitive abilities of LLMs, and probably the the easiest metacognitive ability that the LLM can do is metalinguistics. Why? Because they're trained essentially on language, right? The training data is language. So we, can, we have to ask ourselves, can they analyze language itself? Um, and why is this question important? Basically, it tells us that we can test the network for the next level of ability, right? So cognitively, metalinguistics is, comes later in development, is more complex. Um, and also, I'm going to try to uh, show that linguistic formalism, so, <laughs> you know, formal linguistic theory that was developed by, um, you know, Chomsky and people before him is a really good tool to do this kind of behavioral interpretability of these models. Now that we cannot really do uh, introspective behavior uh, inter uh, interpretability anymore or not as, as easily. So you can ask yourself, you know, does GPT-4 has access or learns linguistic structure by asking the model itself how much of that you have, right? So this is kind of a linguistic theory. Formalism is a really nice tool 
to introspect the model's behavior, what I call behavioral interpretability. So back in the day, I mean, when models were still small, I guess we can still do that. But interpretability meant that you can, you know, look inside the neurons and say, oh, these neurons aren't doing that. Uh, now that the models are proprietary and huge to the degree that it's really difficult to do, you know, um, a sophisticated computation of them, um, we might have this other tool, which is behavior interpretability, where you could just explicitly ask the model, what did you do? Or how did you get to this answer? And um, meta-linguistic aspect is one of the easiest for, um, to do that, or, uh, easiest way to do that. Um, so far, the models were not good on meta-linguistics, right? GPT-3, BARD, and other models, not really good, not giving consistent answer, not, not, they, didn't, they weren't able to analyze language itself. Um, and we argue that GPT-4 might be the first model that can cons coherently give um, meta-linguistic analysis. Basically, they can act as linguists and use linguistic theory, linguistic formalism, to analyze sentences. So how does this look like? So not only you can ask the model, um, you know, who did what in the sentence, the mouse, the cat, the dog painted, thought, sang, it can also, also tell them, you know, use Chomsky's syntactic formalism and analyze the sentence. And it, you know, spells out a nice LaTeX version of, uh, of, of what linguists would do um, with, you know, triple central betting sentence uh, with a really, really good approximation to how a linguist would analyze this sentence. So um, there's all sorts of things that you can test with it. I mean, syntax, syntacticians for decades have been coming with this really cool examples to see how much of structure do uh, the people have, right? And one of the most famous examples is, you know, I saw, I saw an elephant with binoculars. That sentence has two readings. The elephant can have binoculars or you saw it with the binoculars, right? And if you ask GPT-3, uh, you know, analyze this sentence, it just gives you a, the same structure for both sentences. Now GPT-4 gives you a nice distinction between first sentence where the binoculars are modifying uh, the, the, um, the verb, um, and the second sentence where binoculars are modifying the elephant, right? I couldn't do this in a stable diffusion. I couldn't find a way to make stable diffusion draw elephant with binoculars. Um, so maybe you say, well, you know, it saw a million of linguistic textbooks where this sentence was prominently discussed. Um, and that's a valid projection, but there's a way we can uh, work around that. Um, so you can come up with other sentences that are less prevalent in linguistic textbooks. So I've had my baby turtles. Uh, this is getting into a little uh, inappropriate territory. Um, and that sentence too has two readings, right? Uh, you have small baby young turtles and you feed them, or you have a baby and you feed them the turtles. Um, GPT-4 nicely um, gets both readings and analyzes them as a linguist would. I was trying real hard to do this in stable diffusion. I said, how do I make a picture of a baby, of somebody feeding baby turtles, feeding the big human baby turtles? And I was having trouble, and then maybe I should change the style. And then, okay, what painter would allow such a thing? And the obviously obvious answer is Hieronymus Bosch. And if you actually say, you know, I fed the baby turtle in the style of Hieronymus Bosch, it's the only way I could get a picture, and this is not even the, the most bad one. There are like worse pictures. So um, stable diffusion, I apparently was able to do it only with the Hieronymus Bosch style. Not only you can do that in English, which is, you know, probably, probably in the training. I mean, it's possible that the models have a lot of labeled data, syntactic data in the training. So you can do it in other languages. Um, and there's all sorts of things you can do. Um, you know, you can have a German sentence, was hat Hans gesagt, dass er gestern gegessen hat, or what did Hans say that he ate yesterday? Um, and, you know, it produces trees um, that would look good to linguists that reveal that, you know, it really has a good representation of the structure behind this, this sentence. And, and, you know, there are really fine-grained details that you can force the model to check. So it can have traces, it can have all sorts of um, um, linguistic, theoretical linguistic approaches that, that um, you know, we have learned throughout the history. 
So you might say, well, this is all um, memorized and you know, just um, not, not too, uh, too big of a deal if, if they can generalize from this. Luckily, we have phonology. We'll not go into that. But there, you can really make up toy languages that the network for sure didn't have when, because you've just made it up. And um, I'm sure you, you're not too interested in phonological theory, but it can give you really valid explanation of really complex, you know, graduate level phonological theory, for example, optimality theory and so on. It can also do semantic analysis. So basically my point is that we can use linguistic formalism to really test all sorts of things that we've been testing. And what we've done in, in this paper is just a few of them. Um, and again, one thing that I, maybe another test case that I, that I can give you that is really interesting. Um, one thing that we believe that only human language has is uh, recursion, right? So uh, a process where you take a constituent and embed it in, a, uh, in, a, in another uh, constituent of the same type infinitely, right? So it's defin in infinity of language. So for example, you can always say, Mary said that John said that whales have language. And then you can always embed that into a higher level uh, sentence. Uh, David said that Mary said that John said that whales have language. And uh, so this humans have this, animals probably not. So now we can test, can artificial neural network, you know, that, can that ability emerge? And you, know, you can give it a bunch of sentences, ask them, is this, a, is this a recursive sentence or not? And it correctly identifies them. And they say, okay, add recursion to these sentences. And it gives you this nice, example uh, for example a cat bit Martha's dog's tail and it adds two more layers a cat bit Martha's neighbor's sister's dog's tail and so on. and it can go really really long we also tested it on visual recursion so how we can deal with visual recursion and apparently um, you know it, it draws this really really <laughs> nice pictures with with kind of recursive structure so what we can learn from this is that um, you know, an ability to do explicit recursion that we thought is only possible in humans can emerge in these large language models. I'm not saying that there, that there are, you know, cognitive possible models, but we can test what is possible and we can kind of have linguistic theory as this, as this window into their um, internal representation. Now that introspection is much more difficult because the models are huge. There are, of course, pitfalls that we discuss in the papers. Uh, we don't know what the model architecture obviously is precisely. Um, we don't know what the training data was, but I mentioned that those are unsur not unsurmountable tasks. We can use phonology, you can make up language. Uh, memorization obviously is a problem in replicability. And so just to conclude, because we're running out of time and we'll, I'll have some time for questions. Um, so the idea is for the first time, LLMs can do uh, metalinguistic, so metacognitive abilities, and there's they can be a window into their you know internal structure and and how they use that. Um, and so LLMs are pretty good linguists. Um, I asked a colleague how how would you rate this output, and they say well B B plus B minus some something along those lines if a graduate student did it. Um, and so uh, yeah, this is this is this is they're good linguists. What well, remains to be seen if if they can provide novel analysis, right? If, if they can give us new insights, they can do pretty well on what is available to them right now. What remains to be seen is they can, if they can be um, innovative. Okay, with some uh, take homes and the QR code where papers are available, I think we have some, question, some time for questions. Uh, we can take a short question and maybe the other, uh, the next speaker can come set up. Thank you. Um, Oh, you mean, oh, well, um, we haven't tested that yet. Yeah, it would be interesting to see. But the, the question, the other question is how well was the language represented? So, you know, there are differences in training data. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for the nice talk.
our next speaker is uh, Wei Ji Su. He'll be telling us about an empirical law of data separation in neural networks. Thank you, and uh, it's my great pleasure to talk about something uh, about my work on deep learning. Uh, I will try to make as much as possible the connection to a large language model. So this is a joint work with my former student, Han Funker, who has started to be a system professor at the University of Rochester. Uh, so this is very simple, and uh, two small and very tiny experiments uh, training a, an eight-layer feed-forward neural network on fashion list with 10 different classes. So here, uh, each point denotes a, a, a image, so we project uh, the, uh, the embedding uh, for a well-trained neural network from first layer, second layer, uh, last layer, onto a two-dimensional plane. So each point is an image. Uh, so you see different colors denote uh, different class classes. That, so there are 10 different classes. So you see from the first layer to the last layer, and the images are gradually separated according to their different classes. And so by the way, so they, uh, this denotes a, the end, end phase of training. So the network has been sufficiently trained. Looks like they are separated, but uh, it's hard. It's not in a precise way that we can describe very clearly. So now let's try to see a experiment, uh, in another experiment, uh, same experiment, but a, a illustration. Here, each point, the y-axis denotes how well the data are separated according to different classes. And this denotes the original data uh, layer zero. So this is the data have, which have passed the first layer, layer one, and this is layer eight. And the one, when you ever see such things, uh, Eureka, so that we can fit a simple least square line, the correlation is almost perfect. So this was a little bit surprise for us when we uh, in the process of doing experiments. Okay. So, so far at this moment, I haven't tell, told you about uh, what does Y stand for. Roughly, Y stands for how well data are separated. It, the value will be large if the data are not well separated according to classes, but be small if they are well separated. But the precise definition will be given very soon. Okay, so, not, so they are the same experiments, and on, the, on this part, it's very rough, but on this part, it's very precise, but they are denoted the same, uh, same experiment. So this point corresponds to this, and this data, and this corresponds to data of, of the parts in the first layer. Okay, uh, okay so, so we have done more experiments and uh, <coughs> with using different optimization methods and uh, with different number of layers. So such linear pattern occurs consistently. So it's like phys physics, a phys phys physical law. And now uh, let's uh, formally introduce what does the y-axis denote. And uh, so it's a classification problem. So there are 10 K different classes. And this is a class mean. And this means, uh, means, for example, an average cat. Okay. And this is a global mean. And now we denote two different, uh, two different matrices. The first matrix denotes the signal. So basically, this is the uh, covariance matrix of the, of the class means. OK, basically measures how, how different an a, a average cat uh, from an average, average dog. Okay. If they are far away from each other, then it's, uh, it's good. The, the matrix will be large in terms of eigenvalues. So this is a noise. So basically, this it denotes the within class variation. How different a typical cat from the average cat? Okay. If this is large, means that the cat has not been concentrated. So uh, finally, we define this measure D. Okay. So this is the trace of the two matrices. So basically, this is the noise denoted by over signal. So this is basically the inverse signal to noise ratio. Essentially, it's pre to project the within class variation as noise onto the k minus one column space spent by these k different classes. Okay. And uh, we have this measure. And we call this is a law. Uh, we call it uh, the law of equity separation because this shows that uh, on the log scale of this D, uh, the improvement across the first layer to last layer is basically equal. It's basically equal. So roughly speaking, this DT, the measure, uh, looks like something happening in physics, like ra radiation. Say a constant times a value between zero and the one to the power of T. T denotes the, how many layers. 
the data have, have passed. Okay. Here, non-linearity is, is crucial. With, if the new network is linear, linear neural network, we won't see such a thing. So we have done, uh, so how does this law emerge? At the beginning, this, the measure can increase at uh, epoch zero. At the beginning, the weights are ID Gaussian, for example, and then the measure can even increase. And after training for just for a while, then they will decrease. And uh, the more you chain, the, the ending value, the smaller the ending value will be. But you see, from just 100 epoch, the, the, the pattern is quite straight, quite linear. So, so far, uh, is this law pervasive? We have done uh, many experiments uh, on most vision classification tasks. Yes, it's pervasive, but not universal. There are some, like, uh, some tasks where the, this law doesn't appear. Okay. And uh, there are some insights and, uh, and the intuition why this happens. Yes. Uh, can we prove this law? Not yet. It's very surprising because usually whenever you see such linear pattern, there must be a very strong, very simple underlying mechanism governing this uh, linear decay. But at this moment, uh, we cannot prove it. And that's really uh, something I hope to see from your comments. Okay, and uh, so we have uh, tests on different data, different balance level, different learning rates. The linear decay is uh, consistent. And uh, different architectures for convolution neural networks is still linear, a little bit farther compared with the feeder forward neural networks. And now let's try uh, maybe yeah, five minutes more. So uh, we can, let's talk about architecture training interpretation uh, from this uh, from this rule. And the first, this shows that the network really needs to be deep, right? Uh, but this is not the whole story. And uh, we can plot the, uh, the law with different number of depths. Okay. And for simple, sim simpler data set, the optimal depth can be like five or six. And uh, for slightly complex data, the optimal depth can be 12, okay. depends on the depth. So this essentially, the slope actually is just a log of row. You see that the log row will be larger. Uh, well, 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 yeah, the row will be become closer to one if you have a larger depth. Okay. And uh, so here, uh, as long as the width is large enough, there's some saturation phenomenon. The law doesn't uh, depend on too much. If you further increase the depth from 100 to 1,000, doesn't. But if the depth is really 20, like 20 neurons, 20 neurons is really small, cannot pass the sufficient information for classification. Um, very interesting, right? The, your, your, the metric you have on the a vertical axis, that's for the training data? Do yeah. you see the same kind of thing for held out data? Does it also do that? Yeah, good question. On the test regime, the linear decay is not that uh, clear. It's uh, just uh, roughly, it's still decreasing, but it's not linear. It's not that linear. It's differently for the, even if the performance is good, even if the generalization is good. Yeah, yeah. Show the same. Yeah, everything here is about the training. Yeah, it's, it's a training is in training. So the training is a is a is the linear pattern is very strong. But when we move to test the linear, we only see decreasing pattern, but not as linear. That's me. Thank you. Okay, and uh, some uh, in, uh, intuition why this law could happen. So this is something like, uh, for example, if we perturb the neural network. Because usually uh, SGD wants to find some local minimum, which is wide, right? So if we perturb the weight, suppose that uh, each fraction will deviate by epsilon. And when does this uh, the overall product change to uh, change the, the perturbation will be minimized? This is where uh, the other fractions are equal to each other if we have the product is, uh, is fixed. So this is a simple geometric inequality. So this shows that if we, for example, we want to double the GVT in two, 10 years, we need to uh, increase the GVT every year by 7%, not too much or not too low every year. So this is some rough intuition, but it's, it's not, that does not constitute a proof. Okay. And this also implies generalization, a good uh, generalization if this law occurs and uh, the generalization in general will be better than when it does not occur. 
And uh, for ResNet, we can recover this law if we cheat each block as a single layer. Okay. Uh, I don't have too much uh, time, but uh, let me jump to things to large language model. The theme of this uh, workshop is a large language model. Uh, so we have done experiments with uh, BERT. We, first of all, we don't see such uh, clear linear decay in la language models in general, unfortunately. Uh, but this is a certain, certainly something we can expect when we before before doing the experiments because uh, for language model because the attention mechanism there is a within layer nonlinearity. The nonlinearity occurs even within a each layer, and also there's a, a, a sequence is not. Uh, it's not a single, there's a, a horizontal relationship and it's not discriminative. So we must need a different measure. But I think this kind of law, if there's such law for language models, it will help us understand the underlying mechanism. Okay, this is the reference. Thanks for your time. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, we have time for a question or two. Very fascinating. Um, just a, a follow-on question. Yeah. If you, have you, you've done this in synthetic settings with synthetic data? Uh, uh, on real, on real data. Actually, for synthetic data, if we generate very synthetic, it's not that complex enough, then actually we don't see such linear decay. Uh, only the, the low still will occur on synthetic data if the synthetic data is complex enough similar to the real, real data. Okay, so mm -hmm. just, yeah, I'll, I'll ask you in the break. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Farisha Khani, um, and she will tell us about collaborative development of NLP models. Hi, everyone. So my name is Farishta. I'm a research scientist at Microsoft, and I want to talk about collaborative development of NLP models. So I want to start my talk with this story that probably everyone has heard. Uh, there is this elephant in the dark, and then there are many people who haven't seen elephant at all. And then they go to the room, and then they want to see what the elephant look like. And then because the room is dark or they have this like headband, they cannot see the whole elephant. So depending on where they touch the elephant, they think that that's what the elephant look like. So the person who touched the tail of the elephant would say that, oh, elephant is a, uh, is look like a rope. This is similar what we do in machine learning. We train, we collect some training data, we fit a model, and then after that, we're like, yes, everywhere would look like this. Then you probably heard a lot, a lot about these like spurious features that happen, and then these interesting errors that appears. For example, if you take some sentiment analysis over the shelf, and then you say, for example, Marco is a terrorist, it says that it's negative. But if you add like Marco is terrorist with blonde hair, suddenly it make it neutral because like having blonde hair, these like movie reviews usually is such a good thing. And then if you bring it back to black hair, again it becomes. Uh, negative and interestingly because my name Fereshte is Iranian and also con has connection to Islam even if I dye my hair still it's uh, negative. So for this talk how are we going to deal with this like training in the dark? So the first motivation is that yes we are going we collect some data we learn somehow how this elephant look like but for example, we have a lot of data from the body of the elephant. So we have like, oh, everything kind of look like this. And then what I want to do in this talk is that how can I enable many experts to come and interact with the model to tell me how this model should look like? So my goal is to have like a lot of people that they know different parts of elephants. They can interact with the model. 
And then hopefully at the end of the day, I come up with something that's uh, the model that is aligned with all these different people expertise. And if you don't like alignment, another motivation is that this like you probably have heard about software 2.0, you uh, ship your model and then some error happens, then what are you going to do? So you should find these errors, you should generalize them, you cannot just like put them in the training data and hope for best. You should generalize and fix box. So this is the motivation behind this talk. And how are we going to handle this? There are two main challenges that we have. The first one is how we should help these humans to operationalize their concept and debug. So usually they have some like very implicit idea, for example, oh, nationality should be neutral, but how can they make this explicit and they teach it to a machine learning model? Second, we should handle interferences. So like in machine learning, usually you cannot change anything locally. If you change something, you're going to change like many different parts of the model. So let's focus on the first one, operationalizing a concept. Let's consider a very simple example. There is this person who cares about uh, religion. Religious should be like, by itself, should not have any sentiment. And then it's going to make sure that if this model is aligned with the theory. The problem is that humans are not very creative. So if you give them a model that, hey, is this aligned with what you believe? They probably come up with like a few sentences, like, hey, I'm Muslim neutral, I love Muslim positive, but they cannot like cover everything. For example, again, if you take like uh, something over the shelf uh, sentiment analysis, these things usually like work, but if you work deeper, you if you like try deeper, you can find examples that it fail. So the concept that the, mod, the human cares, it's usually like super big, they can check like some parts of it, but they might miss another parts. Another problem is that these models are really big. So even if you find bugs and then you put them in the model, they just like memorize it. They can memorize it and then like they are okay with those ones that you found, but they might miss another things. So these are the two challenges that we have. And then how are we addressing this? Since this workshop is about LLM, so we are going to use LLMs. So what's the first insight that we have is that we can use these LLMs to help us to explore this big state space. So how are we going to do this? Uh, one good uh, property that these LLMs have, if you start from like five to seven sentences on a concept that you care, and then put them as a prompt, they can generate like more than 100 examples uh, in the concept that you care. So if I start from like, let's say I care about nationality being neutral, if I start from like, I'm from Afghanistan, I grew up, on, I grew up in Iran, she lives in USA, and then I give these three to Elena, and then it generate like 100, it can generate like 100 examples for me. I choose one of them again, and then I start exploring, and I start doing this like random walk in the status space. And then I, every time I can ask human that, if I'm still in their uh, status space or I'm out. So if I'm out, they would tell me if I'm in, I keep doing this like random work. What's the problem is that this status space is very, very big. So if I'm going to do this like random work, it takes like forever for me to find like some box. So it would be great if I have some idea that where the bugs are. So instead of doing random work, I do more of a guided work. So how can I get this idea of like where the error can appear? Uh, so if I know like where the error is, instead of random work, I can do this like guided work toward like uh, the error. But how can we find these high error regions? We have this, our second insight is that Although these models are very complex, but if we look at, at these like very local regions, then things are easier. Like you saw probably in Taylor expansion, you saw all the, many of interpretability results in machine learning, that if you focus on some like local neighborhood, you can have a simpler model, and simpler model means that you need like less uh, few examples to learn that model. So we are going to use this second insight to help us to find the error regions. 
So as a summary, we have this problem that user cannot sample from their own concept. Our first insight was that we can use LLMs to help us do to either random walk and, or guided walk. And then our second insight was that we can learn a function in a local region that probably needs fewer examples. So our solution is that let's learn a local function in a local region and then use this local function to guide us toward the disagreement. So how does this would work? You come, you give us like just a few examples from the concept that you care. And then I learn a very small model about like uh, your concept. After that, we have this global model that we want to find uh, bugs in it. And then we have this local model that like works well in your concept. And then we use GPT-3 to generate, to do this like uh, guided walk uh, toward like the disagreement regions. So like whenever it generates some sentences, we chose ones that are like more close, like they have higher disagreement between local and global. And then it finally finds some sentences that these two models disagree. And then when it finds that, then we ask human that like, which one is correct. So either the local model is not good enough yet, so it would uh, improve the local model, or we found an error. So we are going and improve the global model. And then after this, we update local and global model, and then we continue this BCD loop until the local model and global model converge, which we call that like right now, the model is aligned with what the user wants. So it things like as you continue, for example, on this um, uh, religious one, like that I'm Muslim, I pray in Moss, you see that after a while, they are completely aligned on simple sentences, and then like harder sentences show up. For example, if you start talking about ISIS, you start talking about Hezbollah. Uh, so as much as these uh, LLMs, here we are using GPT-3, are like know about the concept, we get like more coverage of the concept. To put everything in one slide, so we have these like LLMs that are have high speed, they're really good with language generation. We have global model that has good speed, know about the task, but has like very bad idea about the user concept. We have user that knows about the user concept, but it's bad on language generation and doesn't have speed. And then what we did is that we have this like proxy model that has a high speed and high user concept. So there would be like a lot of interaction between global, local, and LLMs. And then whenever there is a disagreement, we ask users. So that's why the arrow has uh, its thinner. So uh, the first part of the talk, as I said, was about operationalizing concept. We have these problems that users are really bad on sampling uh, in their data set or explaining what they want. And our solution was to use LLMs or, uh, and also use the fact that local functions are easier to solve this problem. Let's now look at the handling interference. So there are a lot of work in the literature that they show if you fix something, you're going to break another thing, like you do adversarial training, your generalization goes down, you fix like some spurious feature, then like uh, you see that the accuracy goes down for other things. You can see this in like very literature, they call it like lipstick on the pig, they fix something, some other things break. So how are we going to handle this? Like we fix something, we align, but we are, how are we going to like deal with these interferences? To some, give you some intuition that like about interference is that for example, let's say you have two Gaussian and then you wanna like classify them. And then here, if you have like one or two examples with like high probability, you would have like a very high accuracy classifier. So I need only like a few examples and then I classify them very well. However, if I like a new user come with new set of data, suddenly it still uh, start interfering with the previous uh, data. So now I need to sample like these data that are like very low probability to sample uh, from them. Now I need to do uh, sample from them. So how are we going to handle this? Again, remember that like I have proxies for every local uh, user, so I can use those to again focus on disagreements and deal with this. So here uh, you can see that I have the 
uh, I have like one local concept for these users and then another local classifier for this. And then all I need to do is to focus on these disagreements to uh, handle this problem. So the model right now is just like as previous one, in instead of like now one user, we have like different users and then uh, they can handle interferences because they have their proxy. So as a summary, we have these problems of operationalization that user cannot uh, sample and we solve it by relying on LLMs and relying on the fact that um, we can use LLMs and like these local functions to help us. And for interference, we again use this fact that we have these local functions that they can help us to deal with interferences. Um, so we did like bunch of experiments, but I probably don't have time to go through them. And yes, so we start with like, we usually do training in the dark. We want to do collaborative development. We show how to do operationalizing concept. We go through handling interferences. I showed some experiments. You can see in the paper that it's working. And then that's a conclusion. I really believe that like it would be great instead of like a, si a single entity decide that how these models uh, behave. If we have something like Wikipedia for these like models that how they should operate it would be great. Thank you. Thank you for your shift for the nice talk. Uh, we have time for one question, one or two. Maybe in the meantime. Any questions? Okay, if not, uh, let's thank Farisha once again. Our uh, next speaker is Jia Xu, who will tell us about the Reservoir Transformer at Infinite Horizon. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thanks for the introduction. Um, today, I'm going to present the work together with my uh, uh, PhD student, uh, Amit Kosher. So we're going to talk about a uh, Reservoir Transformer, a new type of transformer that can handle arbitrary uh, long input. Um, so we all know that transformer right now has extensive uh, ability demonstrated, including in the large language model. However, one not well known restriction of the language model um, implemented, for example, with transformer is the input length. So so far, the transformer itself can handle um, one o twenty four in the previous version. Uh, in the earlier version, tokens as input. Um, there are a lot of work trying to increase the input length of transformer so that it consider more context, including, for example, T5, 3.5, and GBT4, and so on. There's also recent work called uh, unlimited former that can handle 500K. Still, these are all restricted lengths. So we are claiming that theoretically we can find something that almost has no um, clear restriction on the input length. And I will show you how we do that. Um, before I start, I want to talk about why context matters. Here's a small um, story adapted from Xu Li. 
and uh, originally we talked about papaya and adapt it into the apple tree. So um, rabbit white is lying under a tree full of apple conveniently, and suddenly the apple fall down and has the sound. For example, the sound is gudong, and then the rabbit thought it's something strange. So it started to shout, is this a, probably the monster coming? And then the rabbit told the monkey, and the monkey told a fox, and the fox told bear, deer, tiger, and they all joined, and they think the monster with three, um, uh, with three eyes. So in this context, let's say we want to do a um, uh, little question answering. So when we just know the later part, the short sentences at the end, we do not have enough memory to read the beginning and only read the end. So for this question, what is found is going to answer the monster is coming. However, if we have access to the whole text, then we know actually the apple is falling from the tree. So in that case, we definitely need long context to get a correct answer, which is very different. Now, what we learn from this lesson, we're gonna read from the end back to the beginning. Um, since context is so important, what hinders us to use long context so far? It is because transformer memory and time grow quadratically with the sequence length. Therefore, the training is actually very, very expensive. Mm, then what shall we do? How do we remove the training? What? Are we not in machine learning workshop now? <laughs> okay, so I'm not completely removing the training, of course, but I'm introducing something some kind of architect that doesn't need training. So this is not what I invented. It's already previously used in different fields. And we're introducing this reservoir into the transformer here in the reservoir layers. So inside the neuron in the reservoir layer, they have fixed weights. And these are initially randomized, these weights. So we do not have the problem of training this part. And you can consider is that you're reading, reading a lot of things, and those weights are fixed. If, for example, you can linear or nonlinear combine what you read together. In fact, in this case, nonlinear combined. But you don't need to retrain the, the, the weights. You're relying on the large corpus to give you some information there. But you do need to train at the end in the readout layer. But the readout layer is um, just one layer, and usually that were linear read out originally. So how about we combine this with the transformer? That means we have two parts. One is sentence-wise dependency. That means the whole document, for example, a book, I will read with the reservoir. And then within the sentence, I still read with the transformer because there's less than a thousand input tokens. And if I combine these two, I'm going to have both very long, very long memory which is less computationally expensive, and also the transformer itself that I can, can give a good attention score from each of the words in the sentence. So I have like more precise uh, learning within the sentence and more rough learning across the sentence in the whole document or longer articles. So um, this is a basic idea, but if you just plug it in, it's not going to work very well. So the first challenge we meet is the, the linear readout because the, the reservoir output size equals the transformer input size. The output goes to the transformer input. Therefore, the transformer input size, since we say it cannot be very large, we cannot disrestrict the reservoir output size and then re restrict it the uh, number of neurons we can use in the reservoir. Therefore, we need to opt modify the linear readout with nonlinear readout, where we use attention 
network here. So usually uh, here is the, the linear readout that we can put into an attention neural network. And here we replace it with a self attention neural network with uh, two layers. So this is the first challenge. Um, the second challenge is that uh, when we have very, very long Fourier casting, for example, Sam Seeger first Fourier casting, um, in Chow system, there is something called butterfly effect. So the prediction actually become really very, very difficult um, after a certain period of time. And this is very much relying on the initial condition of the input states. So this sensitivity makes it very difficult for prediction. And therefore, we have introduced group reservoir to unsample the different input initialization so that the result become more robust. Um, OK, come back to the experiments. Um, here is um, a result on the deep echo sensitivity data set. And here we have the reservoir transformer. Uh, this number of parameters, the number of parameters is very small. And the number, the, the loss is also small compared to, for example, transformers in LCM and so on. The rest of them are here. And uh, for time series Fourier casting, we tested several. One is uh, the website visitors, gold price, and also demand price, Bitcoin uh, historical data set. We all got deduction from MSE and uh, also improvement from the other criterions. And uh, we also tried, uh, for example, other like currency exchange rate and several other coppers and compared with, for example, nlinear, linear, dlinear, and so on. Um, and also a number of uh, kind of uh, variation on transformers. So we got also improvement overall. And also the air quality get improvement uh, in our prediction. And uh, come back to the language model, uh, the reservoir BERT that we adapted um, has the lowest perplexity. This is text tested on the wiki text. And uh, last, we also tried on the chatbot together with multimodal features, we also got uh, increased uh, talking durations. So this is the kind of very much uh, kind of goal of the duration of the conversation, like 20 minutes. And this is uh, what we achieve now together with the multimodal input. So this result is not alone from reservoir for this size, but also combined with some other new method together. Okay, so in summary, we have introduced a reservoir transformer that can handle very long context, which is not expensive. And we are able to fully cast events that is very far away. And we show some improvements experimentally on time series task and some NLP task. Thank you. We have time for some questions. It's interesting. I, I missed something. Um, for the context dependence for transformers, there's you, you mentioned in terms of training, which you could, which you're avoiding, but there's also just in terms of executing. I do, you do. We're there, doing training, but we are not training on the whole data. So we're training on part of it. this picture okay maybe this one is easier so we are training so let's say we have the whole book as one sample okay this is trained here the book is trained here the sentence is trained here so we avoid to train the whole book here so that there's no back prop from the training of the sentences no, it doesn't go, to, to it doesn't go back it, only here uh, here is retrained. This doesn't go back. This is this okay. is fixed. Here is retrained. 
any other questions? Um, I have one question, maybe while the next speaker uh, starts to set up. Uh, what do you think are the limitations of the reservoir model? So the limitation of the model um, it depends on your standard. So if I want to have uh, even more efficiency, more high quality results, um, so far we have, just compared to the transformer, we have improvements on the efficiency and also on the accuracy. But if we want more e efficiency and more accuracy here, um, for example, in certain tasks, um, we, we need, oh, for example, for example, certain tasks, we need adaptation. Let's say when we do the bird, uh, this has to be redesigned. We cannot use it directly. And this has to be redesigned for the bird uh, application. Yeah. So this is one of the limitations. Clearly, it could be other limitations on this. Okay, great. Um, thank you again. Our next speaker is Song Mai, who will tell, tell us about transformers as statisticians. Yeah. Thanks for the organizer and for the audience. Today I'm going to talk about uh, transformers are statisticians. Well, uh, two days ago, Jacob also talked about uh, language models are statisticians, but he mostly talked about from more application perspective. For example, he showed that transformers can use to generate a uh, hypothesis and uh, today I'm going to more focus on a theoretical perspective. I'm going to uh, prove that transformers can perform in-context learning and in-context algorithm selection. And uh, this is more like a neural network approximation theory kind of perspective. This is a joint work with Fan Chen, an undergrad student at Peking University, and Yu Bai, my long-term collaborator at Salesforce Research, well, this project uh, cannot be done without uh, uh, these two collaborators. And then Huan Wang and uh, Cai Ming Xiong from Salesforce Research. Okay, so uh, Surya and uh, Greg have uh, mentioned, have talked about uh, in detail about this in-context learning so that I don't need to uh, introduce uh, in very detail again. But uh, well, in-context learning is that, well, suppose we have data set X, I, Y, I, for ID following some distribution. And uh, what we can do is just to input these X, I, Y, I concatenations and this X, N plus one as a prompt into the ChatGPT or transformers. And then this ChatGPT can answer uh, something that is Y, N plus one hatch. And hopefully the answer is close to this Y, N plus one. In this example, while well, apple is x1, fruit y1, so you can see that there is some relationship, and sofa is a furniture, so bird, well, then this transformer will answer animal. And uh, Greg and Surya have shown you some figures saying that, well, transformers, well, can perform a linear regression or logistic regression, at least uh, it has a similar performance of these uh, very good algorithms. And uh, the, uh, in this talk, I would like to show you uh, a further experiment. Okay, so suppose we have two meta tasks. One meta task is a regression task 
where the beta, the parameter is like normal zero identity, y is a linear function of x associated with this beta, and we form a data set z rec, which is this x i y pairs that is generated from the same beta. So for a single data set, is as it associates to a single beta, but then we will generate a ID a data sets. So these are meta data points of uh, the input of a pre-training transformer. And another class of tasks is this classification tasks where beta is normal zero identity, y is binary, and uh, we have this x, i, y pairs as a data set or as a meta data point. And we train three transformers. So we train a transformer TF rec using a bunch of regression data, uh, regression data sets. These data sets are ID, but for a single data set, they are composed of these X, I, Y pairs that are, well, ID conditional on this beta. But for different tasks, the beta are different. And we train another transformer TF CLS using this classification data set. We train a third transformer using the mixture data sets. So half of the data points are from these regression data sets, half of the data set, half, half of these meta data points are from this classification data set. And as we expect, well, the first transformer will have similar performance as linear regression as shown by the figure of Surya and the Greg. And the classification, this TF classification has similar performance as logistic regression. And the question is, what about the performance of the third transformer? So here, this is the experimental result. So the left-hand side, this is the test performance of these three transformers on regression task. Right-hand side, this is the performance on classification task. As you can see, this blue, uh, this like TF red, this orange curve, match the performance of linear regression as expected by the TF-CLS is suboptimal. But TF algorithm selection, while well, this is a third transformer, match the performance of tf rec the same as linear regression. On the right-hand side, this TF-CLS match the performance of logistic regression as expected. TF regression is suboptimal, but TF algorithm selection match the performance of, TF, uh, match the performance of logistic regression. So while well, this is surprising because while well, we didn't tell this TF algorithm selection which task uh, this is. So we just input a bunch of X, I, Y pairs. This Y may be real or maybe binary, but we don't tell this transformer, well, which algorithm you should perform. But then this transformer can select a proper algorithm on any task. Okay, so while well, this is Y, uh, we say that, well, these transformers can perform uh, some data analysis algorithm selection like a statistician. So today, this talk, I will explain why transformers can perform two things. First, basic in-context learning algorithm. Second, in-context algorithm selection. So this is a theory talk. So to answer the question, why transformers can perform in-context in algorithm selection, going to look into the inner structure of the transformer. Okay. So first, let's uh, talk about the input-output format of our construction. So the input is a matrix H, which is, uh, well, each token, well, is X, I, Y pairs. So the first token is X, I, X1, Y1, last token, X, N plus one, but here, this Y place, we left it to be zero. Well, this is a place that is reserved for the output. And then here we insert some zeros uh, to be used as scratch pad. And this scratch pad is very important as we will see later, uh, a lot of the most computations will happen at this scratch pad. So notice that this uh, input format is a little bit different from um, uh, Greg's or Surya's. Uh, talk in their format, well, the input token is x0, 0, y. But uh, here, the input format, although it's different, but uh, you can uh, very simply translate translate their input format to this format. So this is without loss of generality. 
we hope to construct a transformer. Well, a transformer is a sequence to sequence function. So the output of the transformer is a, still a matrix. And we hope that this zero place will be this y hat n plus one, which is, uh, well, suppose the data set is a generalized linear model. We hope that this y hat n plus one will fit this generalized linear model and output something that is close to y n plus one. And uh, we argue that transformer can accomplish this task by performing approximate gradient descent on some hypothetical empirical risk. So suppose this is, well, this is an empirical risk of this uh, regression of this log of generalized linear model task. And uh, the gradient descent has this format. Okay. So we want to show that this transformer can, well, implement this algorithm in context. Well, it is like architecture. So what is architecture of a transformer? A transformer is an iterative composition of feed forward layers and attention layers. So the feed forward layers is not very important. It's just a two layer neural network of each token with a residual connection structure. And what is important is, is attention layer. Well, here this is a mathematical formulation of attention layer. Each token HI is updated by these Q, K, V interactions. So this is the inner product of Q, query, key, and then pass through a nonlinearity, and then times the value matrix. Average over the tokens and sum over the head, number, sum over the heads. So one caveat here is that, well, uh, in our theoretical construction, we made one uh, modification, which is that, well, this sigma, we take it to be a ReLU function instead of a softmax function. And uh, this is sort of important to obtain some quantitative error control in our construction. Okay, so, well, we want to show that this transformer can implement gradient descent. And uh, let's compare what's the architecture, what's the formulation of attention layer and gradient descent algorithm. So you can see that an attention layer is just uh, updating this token by this QKV interaction. And if you write down gradient descent algorithm, this is like the Iter this uh, parameter w is updated by this x w y interaction, and uh, you can see that well there are many similarities among these uh, uh, in this expression. Well, it turns out that well suppose you just uh, construct this q q k v matrices, and then this attention layer and gradient descent uh, formulation are uh, exactly the same. So for uh, we can just uh, take this H to be X, Y, W, where this zero place was the scratch pad. And here we store it, uh, we store the weight update of this gradient descent. And then by some uh, construction of the QKV, we can show that, well, these two expression will match. So that means a single attention layer can implement one step gradient descent. So you, you concatenate these attention layers, it can implement L steps of gradient descent using L layers of tensions. Uh, what about these feed forward layers? We can show that these feed forward layers are good at implementing this uh, proximal function. So that means this transformer architecture can implement proximal gradient descent, which can be used to solve this uh, uh, SO problem. Okay, so Theoretically, we can show that, well, uh, there is a transformer with controlled embedding dimension, number of layers, number of attention heads, feed forward layer width, and norm of parameters, such that these transformers can implement ridge regression, logistic regression, and lasso. And uh, these algorithms can achieve minimax uh, optimal uh, error on a certain data distribution, slender data distribution. And additionally, well, we can find this transformer that implement this algorithm with comparable error uh, efficiently by just uh, pre-training this transformer, minimizing, well, this is just a supervised uh, meta-learning kind of thing, just uh, minimizing some empirical risk, and uh, you get some generalization error control where this uh, thing on top is polynomial in um, associate parameters. Okay, so, 
Here, this is our theoretical result upon like how transformers can implement individual basic income tax learning algorithm. And uh, we want to also show that transformer can perform algorithm selection like this, or it can implement regression on regression task and uh, classification on classification task. So how can transformer implement this? Well, we propose two mechanisms. Mechanism one, post SEL validation. Well, this transformer can run K algorithms in parallel and select algorithm with small validation error. So to achieve this, it just you just need to um, we just need one additional layer of attention layer, and uh, just uh, uh, okay, so maybe like three additional layers of transformers uh, at the end, and uh, do this train validation test. The second mechanism is pre-SL testing, and uh, it can form a hypothesis to select algorithm. Okay, so for example, if we want a transformer to implement this regression versus classification problem, first, the transformer can just uh, perform a binary test on these Ys. If these Ys are regression, are just real numbers, well, uh, the transformer then will implement this regression algorithm. If these Ys are binary, then transformers can implement this classification. So this is a construction result and, uh, uh, and the error can be controlled quantitatively. And uh, there is another mechanism called post SEL validation. So basically, it can perform just a train validation splitting and uh, uh, perform two different algorithms on this training data set and uh, select the algorithm by looking at the test error evaluate on this validation data set. And that's going to okay. So, in summary, we proved that transformers can efficiently implement simple SEL algorithms using the gradient descent mechanism and can efficiently implement algorithm selection similar to a statistician. And such transformers can be pre-trained statistically efficiently. Yeah, this summarizes my talk. Thank you. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, we have time for a question or two. Uh, for for the gradient descent on the data, I think in earlier today's talk, there's a double descent like phenomenon. It's more like solve the d square like exactly almost, but the, the gradient descent I think is depending on the number of layers, right? Or in, in this uh, construction. Uh, here, well, there's no double descent because we consider a uh, regression task without any noise. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm saying like because in the proof, I think. Uh, from my understanding is each layer is performing one step of gradient descent. Right, right. Uh, but I, I think if the layer number is say 20, mm -hmm. I think 20 is, cannot be guaranteed to converge to very close to optimal. Uh, I feel like because linear regression, the convergence is exponentially fast, right? So 20 layers, I think the error is like already very small. So I think it's not a problem. Uh, I think uh, 20 layers already converge to good. I think. Our, uh, our architecture is not uh, very deep. It's going to be eight layers transform. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, OK. Uh, thank you, Yan and Song, for the great talk. Maybe we'll click through them manually. <laughs> if there's something broken on this, or is there a different way to use it? Do I need to like? Okay. And what? I don't know what that means. Slideshow. There you go. Okay. So. I'm Bob Carpenter. I'm coming from the Center for Computational Math at Flatiron Institute, which is also hosted by Simons Foundation, or at least paid for by Simons Foundation. Um, and what I want to talk to you about is taking the standard kind of reinforcement learning that we're doing now and softening it a bit. And I want to motivate both. I want to tell you both what that is 
and what I think we'll get out of doing that, which is, I think, quite a lot if we can generalize from other cases where this has worked very well, right? So what are we doing? And so far, I know what happened up to GPT-3 because they wrote about it, but then they stopped writing about it. So I'm just going to tell you what they did at that point. So they massively pre-trained a transformer on a ton of data, right? And then they retrained it again. They retrained the weights to be helpful, harmless, and truthful, right? At least to the extent possible. The alignment data is critically based on human feedback. That is specifically what we're doing is we're taking the output of GPT and we're saying, hey, here are two outputs. Which one of these are better, output A or output B? So the human judgments are going to be in the form of which one of these things are better, right? The training loss for this, as Chris Manning went over, is a kind of Bradley-Terry model, right? We basically have a reward model for each one of our outputs. And what we're doing is we're looking at the difference on a logistic scale between the rewards for these things, right? So we get this loss that basically says we want the score for A to be a lot higher than the score for B if the human annotator said that A was better than B, right? So the exact form of this stuff doesn't really matter, so don't get hung up in the details of the, the math here. So what, one thing I wanna point out, the human feedback is relatively inexpensive. They did this by hiring 40 contractors for Upwork. They didn't say for how long they hired them for, but even if they hired them for a year at $50,000 a year each, that's still only $2 million. That seems like a lot of money. It's more than I can go spend on a project. But compared to the $500 million in hardware they have, the AI researchers they're paying for it at least half a million dollars a year, all the data licensing servers, this is like chunk change. Right? This is like in the noise of the amount of money they're spending on doing this. And one of the main points of this that I have is that I think there's a headroom for a lot more investment in terms of reinforcement training right now. Right? If we think about the scaling results, we have all these scaling results for like how much data we have, how much parameters we have given the compute. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conjecture there's a scaling law for how much data and training we do, how much human feedback we do given dollars. And I think we're probably not putting enough money into human feedback and not really doing it in the most optimal possible way. Right. So one of the things that they report in the alignment paper from OpenAI is that inter annotator agreements only 73%. You give people a bunch of these things, right? And this was their hand selected, hand trained annotators. Right? When they were done, their agreement on saying that A is better than B was only about 70%. Right? So the, one of the problems here is that the goals they're asking them to evaluate, helpful, harmless, and truthful, are at odds with each other. Right? Being helpful and providing an answer can sometimes get in the way of truthfulness or harmfulness, depending on what I ask you to do it. So OpenAI say that they prioritized being helpful and they filtered it later for harmfulness and truthfulness. I'm not exactly sure what that means. There's just a note in the appendix of their paper. Um, but the traditional approaches to multi-annotation when you have multiple annotators, right, is to either just don't do it, just have your data annotated by a single person. And I have a feeling that's probably what they did. They probably did a little study to figure out what the inner annotator agreement did and said, yeah, 70%, that's good enough. Let's just go single annotate because that's kind of more efficient in training for the annotator time you have sometimes, right? You can also take majority voting, which I would say is probably the most commonly done thing in machine learning, right? The other thing that's very common in machine learning is to censor non-agreement. If you have some item in the training debt set and the annotators don't agree on it, just throw it out and don't use it. Maybe it's low quality data, right? I'm going to argue that all of these are bad approaches, right? Don't do any of these things. There's better ways to do this stuff. Right? So let me just motivate this with a simple example with classifiers. And I guess people have set this up for me. Right? So I'm just going to lay out a Bayesian logistic regression here. Right? It has, we have Yn as the outcomes, Xn are our covariates or our features, alpha and beta are our regression coefficients. We're just going to assume that we have some normal distribution over the, over the covariates. That doesn't really matter. And we're going to throw some kind of prior on these. Again, that's not really part of the point here. But the way to think about this is that the logit that this is equal to one is just gonna be this linear function of the predictors. That's just what logistic regression does. So the question is, how do we create a gold standard, right? What does a gold standard look like? Well, it quantizes these yn's down to zeros or ones. Even though I've got some probability that yn is equal to one here, at the point I create a gold standard, I'm either gonna say zero or one, 
right? And I can do that in two traditional ways. If I want to create an actual something that looks like a gold standard that has a definite answer for every item, either I can take my best guess, I can say if the probability that it's equal to one is greater than a half, set it equal to one. This is typically what machine learning people do. This is really bad. Don't do that, right? This is much better. This is what a statistician would do. Instead of saying, set it equal to one if the probability is greater than half, sample it, right? The reason we want to sample it is we want to propagate our uncertainty through our inference processes as much as possible, right? This is saying we're not really certain which one it is. We peg it up to the most likely one. We're going to introduce bias into our estimators, right? It's much better, right? And you can do this all under simulation with logistic regression in like an hour on your computer, especially with GPT's help, right? It's very easy to demonstrate this kind of stuff in simple cases. Right? So any one of these standards that we create is a kind of fool's gold standard, right? We know we have some kind of probabilistic output from the system, yet we're pegging a label at one or zero. We're not really that confident in the one or zero. So sampling dominates taking the best guess, as I said before, but oversampling is even better, right? I can sample one Y according to this probability, but I can sample more. And then I might get multiple things with different labels, and I'm going to get them roughly weighted according to the probability that yn is equal to 1. But weighted training is really the way to go. If you have access to this and you can do this, this is by far better than anything else you can do. right? Instead of saying that my loss is just based on a 0 or 1, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this equal to the probability that it's going to be 1, and then I'm going to provide a weighted penalty for it being equal to one and a weighted penalty for it being equal to zero, right? I've swapped the reward order in here, right? What does this do, right? Why are we doing this for task-driven regularization, right? We think about regression. Regressions tend to be more robust when you regularize them or you apply some kind of shrinkage. Like regularization is going to look like empirical bays where we shrink things to the population average. Shrinkage is just going to bring things down to zero. What this is going to do, it's going to say for this particular instance of AN and BN, I'm only 70% sure that AN is better than BN. So what it's going to do, it's going to try to make the classifier respect that, right? It's going to try to make the classifier push the rewards for those things closer together such that this comes out to be close to the probability that I'm training with. If I said 70% chance of this being a zero or one, that's what I want to train with. And it's going to push the classifier to make that answer, to not be extreme. A lot of machine learning classifiers are very poorly calibrated because they push prediction probabilities to zero and one. One of the reasons is they're not trained with this kind of, kind of thing, right? So what can we do? I've only got a couple more slides here. We can Create a model of annotation. I've been working on this. This was the problem that drove me out of natural language processing the first time when I was at a company doing this because we kept having to create data sets and into Bayesian statistics because I wanted to figure out how to do this problem correctly. A very simple model of this is David and Skeens from 1978, right? And what we want to do is they give us a model of rater accuracy and bias that's going to let us predict what's the probability that AN is greater than BN not given the underlying coefficients, not given the underlying predictors, but just given the human feedback, right? So I ask a bunch of humans, right? They give me, I have some probability that AN is greater than BN. Now we can do the same thing again, right? What I was giving you before was like the simulation take on this. This is what we're going to do for real. We're going to have them rate these things. We're going to have them do this. But now we have the same choices. We can take this. This is going to be a probability. We can either use this for weighted training or we can sample, or we can take the highest probability. There's a huge gap between these two things. There's a pretty big gap between these two things in efficiency, right? So multiple sampling winds up converging to weighted as the sample size increases, but you may need a lot of samples. Yeah. Sorry, whose feedback is being used in the David, or the, uh, the model above, the 978 model? We're, we're having a bunch of human raters. We're giving, you know, this, we, we take the people we got on Upwork or wherever, and we give them a bunch of examples, and they say yes, no, whatever, and we take all that human feedback. So is that their accuracy and bias, or is that the model's accuracy and bias? This is going to be estimating what the probability is based on the human feedback. We can't assume this is the correct answer. But usually it's going to be a lot closer than assuming zero or one. 
or taking a majority vote. Generally, these models are pretty good. So um, the weighted training winds up Raul Blackwellizing the sampling. Perfect, I'm almost done, which is really nice. David Blackwell was here. They just named a dorm after him. So um, majority voting, which is common, that's equivalent to taking the best guess with respect to some kind of degenerate model. Right, so what happens is this weighted training winds up regularizing. There's a really great paper in JMLR from 2010 by Vikas Rekar and a bunch of other people from Siemens on image recognition. Right, and what they showed is it's possible to jointly estimate both the classifier and the David scheme model, but more importantly, they showed that taking these probabilities, even though it's very easy to show in theory, they actually did this to a real problem so they could get it published in an ML journal rather than just a stats journal, right, and showed that this actually works. Right. And our loss winds up looking like this, where we have the differences of the rewards. And it's regularized because what it wants to do, it minimizes this loss that we've set up at the point where the system assigns a probability equal to, from the true data, equal to what the raters said. Oh, sorry, that should have been a psi because I changed notation there. I think that's all I've got. So I'll leave it on the references there. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one question. So in the um, you know in the scheme where where you said you should you should uh, change things act probabilistically so you don't mm -hmm. change the the statistics uh, much or the expectations. So um, what if you only wanted to act if the in the case that um, that the signal was very large. If you wanted to condition on that, would, could you could you then modify your your uh, the policy? signal? The signal is very large in terms of the signal from the radar from or the, the radar. signal from yeah. the predictor. The the David Skeen model does that, right? Yeah, what okay. it does is it basically estimates the radar's accuracies and biases, and then it adjusts for that. If you have a, if you have basically a spammy type radar, right? It's basically cancels out their contribution, and and they don't have any anything. So. It tries to extract the most information, and there's a lot more on this. So this stuff's all being rediscovered as well. So while I was here, somebody told me that John Ducci at Stanford wrote a paper on this. This is very similar to the other 10 papers that have been written on this topic. It's like, I have a feeling people come into this and don't realize that like lots of people have worked on this problem, right? So this is there's a little more theory here, but it, it missed all the references to the literature in the last 10 or 15 years, but it's another another paper along these. This is a paper that I wrote with Becky Passano on WordSense that kind of gives you a high level ma a view of how the David and Scheme models work. And the rest are just things I cited in the paper. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks. So we'll meet back here at four for the last uh, session for short talk. <laughs>